<laughs> I am so proud of myself. I had a tweet ready to go so I can just click the button when we go when we go live and start. Only took me how many months to be prepared <laughs> for this? Okay. Okay. I feel like I should have told Julia specifically about this one because the theme of motherhood is one that's going to come up. <laughs> Maybe she'll sense it. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, this is the closest I've cut it for all of them. I just finished the book this morning. I feel like my thoughts have not had as much time to percolate as they usually do. Yeah. <laughs> so this will, this will be like your pure reactions. <laughs> yeah. I know. I finished this one last night. I'm always like, when I'm rereading one, I have a much better sense of like how long it's going to take me. So I'm usually not too worried but like at the start of the weekend, I was like, I should finish that thing I'm hosting for. <laughs> that would be good. Um, okay. I am a little like, this is such a superficial thing. I'm a little sad that the Unraveler cover doesn't match this one in Deep Light. I don't know why they went with a different artist or design, but I'm sad about it. <laughs> I just, like uh, Unraveler is its own thing. I've given up like trying to make sense of anything. <laughs> like who is in charge of that entire process? <laughs> like I I don't know. Like I didn't even see a lot of updates on Frances Harding's like social media or anything about it, which I guess isn't surprising because she's obviously not the one making these decisions, but um yeah, I don't know what's going on at that publishing house. <laughs> We just want to keep us guessing. Okay. okay. I didn't really prepare like an introductory question for us about sharing something. So is there anything that you're feeling especially passionate about any books that you're reading or like projects you're gonna have coming up that you want to promote i don't think so well i'm currently reading the silmarillion which is <laughs> taking me um which is a project all of its own yeah <laughs> i still haven't been brave enough to start that one someday <laughs> Yeah. Was there anything that you wanted to share? Um, not really. I'm like cheating and looking at the books that I finished so far. I mean, I'm obsessed with the beautiful ones by Sylvia Moreno Garcia, <laughs> which I finished recently. Um, and almost done with the daughter of Dr. Moreau by her, uh, which is also fantastic. So I guess I could just plug Sylvia Moreno Garcia as an author. Um, cause I think she's incredibly talented. Um, I, it makes me really happy that like she's getting like more mainstream popular because Mexican Gothic took off. Um, I, and I just, I'm so impressed at how many different genres she writes. Like mm -hmm. that is just incredible to me. Um, yeah. So I guess this is my unofficial recommendation that just, <laughs> just read Sylvia Moreno Garcia. Yeah. Uh, no, I need to be the oldest book on my Goodreads TBR is one of hers but I still haven't got around to reading <laughs> one day I'll get there what's the oldest one on your TBR um signal to noise I think oh okay that's an interesting one it's not one of my favorites by her but like the fact that I enjoyed it so much when like the premise didn't pull me in at all I think is indicative of like like she's just an author where I read regardless of genre at this point like I even really enjoyed Velvet Was the Night and I don't like noir at all so yeah, I I think I like there's only one of the things she's written that was like that novella that takes place in space that I still don't have an interest in reading because I don't really like stories that are like too focused on space. Um, but even that one, maybe I'll give in someday. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so I don't know if we want to start with the introductory stuff and um people can like join whenever or do you want to give it a couple more minutes i'm good either way i we can start um i don't know if 
I haven't heard from anyone in particular that they're coming, so I don't know if they're okay. waiting for anyone. So I should I'll like tag Awen really quick in that tweet. Because <laughs> I know she's usually Yeah. I did tell her that it was today, but she didn't mention whether she would was gonna be here or not. Okay. I know she has read it. Okay. And obviously people Hello. watch it back later. Let's see. Hello, I just tagged you on Twitter, so we that. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is going to be our discussion for A Skin Full of Shadows by Frances Harding. Uh, but before we get started, Hannah, do you want to do like a quick little introduction? Um, yeah, anything that you want to like highlight that you have on your blog coming up or anything? I... Hi, um, I'm Hannah, as usual. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I've done this introduction many times. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure I have anything in particular to say at the moment. I've been quite inactive on all platforms recently. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. And Hannah's already linked in the description. So if you are not yet following her, please check her out. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm Kara, obviously. Uh, as Hannah said, we've done these introductions a lot. So I think most of you probably know who we are. Uh, but my channel is obviously Wild Book Garden, which is where we are. Um, we're both big fans of Frances Harding, clearly. And uh, yeah, we just, I can't believe we're getting near the end of the read along. I'm really like so sad. After this one. What are we going to do? Yeah. <laughs> what are we going to do? Yeah. Frances, write more books, please. <laughs> it's for a good cause. Um, okay, so before we get into the discussion, I do want to note the content warnings really quickly. Um, so in our discussion, or like the book has these, and in our discussion, most of them will, I think, come up. Um, content warnings for grief, being inhabited by ghosts, war, murder, religious intolerance, and references to animal cruelty and death, and brief references to the Crusades. Um, and then also kind of just general violence. There's quite a bit of violence in this book. Um, so if any of those are like triggers for you, um, thanks for joining us. We will see you later. Um, so let's go ahead and get in to it as we usually do. Um, Hana, what's your overall thoughts and your rating if you want to give it? I know this was the first time reading this one for you. So I'm very curious to hear what you thought. Yeah, it, I liked it. Um, <laughs> I gave it... Mm, I haven't rated it yet, but it's around a four, probably. I liked mm -hmm. it better than The Lie Tree, but not as much as her other books, I think. And I'm interested to see if, I haven't read, obviously, Unraveler or Deep Light yet, so I'm interested to see when we get there whether this is a long-term change in her writing, because it feels very different to the books prior to The Lie Tree. Mm. That's a good point. Yeah, um, so this was a reread for me, and we mentioned this before, but uh, the reason I'm leading this discussion is this was actually my least favorite of her books, um, the at least like prior to this read along. And I have I gave it the same rating, which is 4.5 stars, because at the time that was what I rated my least favorite Francis Harding book. And even at that time when I first read it, I like still really enjoyed it. It was just like this kind of story wasn't for me as much. Like, I think I even said during one of our live shows that if it had been written by a different author, I probably wouldn't have picked it up. Um, just because this kind of like ghost story is not my thing. Um, but I gave it the same rating, but because of where some of the other books fall, it's like higher in my estimation now. Um, so like still 4.5 stars, but like a more positive <laughs> uh, 4.5 stars. And um, yeah, it was, this is, only the second time I've read this one. And I did also, like, I, I obviously really enjoyed it. Um, I like this, yeah, this is such an interesting story from her. I think this is another one that is like much more historical than her historical fantasies usually are. Like, it's kind of like the lie tree where it's like historical fiction, but like one big magic element, um, which I just think is interesting. So yeah, like I, I appreciated it more on this read. And I think also, I think that one of the reasons that I did like it more this time around is there were things that I knew obviously what to expect. Um, Awen agrees <laughs> with us. Yeah. 
Uh, so I, my thoughts are still kind of crystallizing to you, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, it was interesting because there's a lot of similar story elements to Fly By Night, which is also like an yes, alternate universe. I was Civil thinking War. about that. Um, so I like clearly these are ideas that have been percolating for her for years and years. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It, it's, it's interesting how different the tone is, I guess, in comparison. Yeah, I like I also thought of Fly By Night, especially like some interesting comparisons between Mosca and Makepeace, mm -hmm. uh, but also just like the general like setting and um, I don't know, the time period that the book is set in. And I feel like this book is a much, in my opinion, it feels like a more skillful handling of the ideas, mm -hmm. um, even though obviously we both enjoyed things about Fly By Night. Um, yeah, but like I, there were things about this one where I'm like, okay, this is a thing that Frances Harding thinks is interesting, like <laughs> that she wants to write about a lot. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, if we have any more general thoughts, we can share those. Otherwise, I thought we'd get into the character section, and of course, let's start with Make Peace, our protagonist. Uh, what do you think of her, Anna? I I love Make Peace. I she was just so yeah. This is. This is how we always are. I don't know why you're I know. Like, why, why do we even say, like, what do you think? It's like, let's talk about how much we both love make peace. Like, um, She's just so resourceful, like, right from the start when she's creating those escape plans. Like, she's just so intelligent and so, like, she's so underestimated by everyone around her. But yeah. she, she's just so capable, even though she doesn't know it herself. Yeah. Yeah, she's she's definitely like so smart and definitely resourceful. And I love that like I mean some of the plans that she comes up with like is so impressive. Um and I love that like everything that she does is like in service to like taking care of people she cares about. Um and, and also herself, which is valid. <laughs> um like I love that her I don't know, that she she uses her sneakiness on the on the power like for the power of good um yeah i also i love to make peace um i at this point i'm running out of like adjectives to describe francis harding's main characters because like we pretty much always love them um anyone said loved her so subtly written but so impactful on the page yeah i think she is like she's a very like quietly strong main character which mm -hmm. i know we both tend to enjoy and I really like like you mentioned Hannah that um part of her strength is that people underestimate her and even make peace it takes kind of a while for her to recognize that she is as like smart and talented as she is um yeah so big fan of her <laughs> um and I feel like a, a natural next step is let's talk about bear uh arguably co-protagonist because they're in the same body um yeah so what did you think of bear yeah i i don't know i like so thinking about like the front the fly by night parallels again i was thinking about like saracen versus bear and how they are kind of serve similar function with regard to mosca slash make peace even though bears inside um <laughs> bear is a state of mind <laughs> um but yeah because bear is the person quote unquote who she is closest to who she trusts the most who's you know been who's with her for the longest even when she can't trust anyone else and i think it's so interesting the way she becomes more like bear or you know, tr grows to trust Bear and starts to understand better when he's trying to tell her things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think I remember one of the things that I was thrown by when I first read this and that disappointed me was I was expecting Bear and Makepeace's relationship to be like more of like a friendship or um, I think I was expecting Bear to be characterized more like an animal companion and 
I don't think that's what she was going for. Like he is like, I mean, he is, he is still like a person, you know, but like he is also an animal. And I feel like that was much, it was much more like focused on the animal parts than I feel like these kinds of characters usually are. And I think that threw me off a little bit. Um, but I actually like on second read, I actually really like that he is very much a bear, <laughs> but that they also have, like you said, this trust and this closeness and um, the way that like, like you said, make peace kind of starts becoming more like bear. But also I think bear is uh, like changed by his interactions with make peace. Like, um, I don't know. I feel like the way he's like characterized and the way that like, yeah, obviously a lot of his, choices are based on instinct but the way that he and make peace end up lear learning to work together i think he does grow and change a little bit so bear was somebody that i i really liked the first time i read it and i of course i felt for him like the poor thing has been through so many horrible things and i was glad that he had somebody on his side now but i think i didn't really appreciate what she was trying to do with him until this time i read it um anyone says bear all my love for bear yeah what <laughs> he's just like he really was like the person that make peace could always rely on. And I feel like the reader could too. It's like, however bad things get, we know bear is in it like for the long haul. <laughs> um, any other thoughts on bear and make peace separately or together? Um, <laughs> which is funny to say they're, like, <laughs> in the same body. Uh, Yes, he is still innately who he is as a bear, but he is a companion in a way. Francis uses his wildness and his growing trust in a unique way. Yes, I think that's very well said. It's like she she was balancing those things really well. And I did not expect that the first time I read it. I was expecting more of like, I mean, even like Saracen, I feel like is written, like he is very much like an animal, but there's a little bit more of like the humanizing for him. Mm -hmm. And that's not what she was doing here, I feel like. Yeah, I see what you mean. And it, it, it takes longer for make peace to understand what bear's trying to tell her like because three years pass in the yeah. middle right and by the time when we see her after that she still hasn't fully like accepted his presence i guess yeah yeah it does it takes her a while like even at the end there's like a couple times where she realizes that she wasn't um, wasn't listening to him as yeah. much as she should have been, um, which I like. I kind of did the same thing because, like, even when he was upset one of those times, I thought it was just reacting to like the general distress of what was going on. And like, so like make peace. I didn't think he had seen anything specific, but he did. Bear always knows. Eowyn <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. tried to explain the brilliance of this concept to her dad and got odd look. <laughs> Yeah. I feel like that's that uh, describing Francis Harding in general. It's, 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 it's I was I was just <laughs> yeah. I was thinking that too. Is like trying to summarize any of her books is like a recipe for some odd odd looks. <laughs> Especially it's like you get to a point. At least I always get to a point where I'm like I can't explain why all of this works, but it does. You just have to trust me and read it. <laughs> like. <sighs> Okay, so um, let's go on to James. So make pieces half brother. Uh, thoughts on him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was unconvinced by James. I think a lot of the problems that I have with the book are a result of James because make peace spends the entire book focused on trying to save him, and I was not convinced that he deserved to be. <laughs> <laughs> that's harsh okay <laughs> no that i don't know I, no, like, I know. it didn't it felt like she cared about him a lot more than he cared about her yeah and like not that i wanted him to be stuck forever but... no i understand i i know what you mean it's like because we love make peace so much and she puts herself in constant like danger for her life over and over when most of the time when we see james he's like screwing up really bad <laughs> Um, yeah, and I didn't like the the whole plot is like they someone even asked to make peace at one point like what is your aim here and she's like I'm gonna save James and then I don't know and the whole mm -hmm. book is 
and make peace trying to save James. And there's no like bigger plot, like the politics aren't, they're just in the background. I, so I felt like I wasn't as invested, like I was invested in make peace herself, but not in the overall story because she was just going from one place to another and it wasn't, didn't feel like it was in service of anything. Yeah, it kind of like the the cause that she ends up taking is like incidental. Like she figures it out as she's trying to mm -hmm. get to James. Um, yeah, I like I liked James, but I was very frustrated by him most of the book. Um, like not not so much for trusting Simmons when he shouldn't, which we'll get to. Although that would have been a valid reason to be annoyed by him. I think it didn't bother me as much because. I'm remembering when I first read this book that I was also not sure some things like where some things were going to go. The thing that bugged me is like Makepeace has this escape plan ready to go. They've been working towards this for like years and he's like, uh, I'm going to stay and be Lord of Misrule and we'll figure it out later. Like, and oh, when he, okay, <laughs> see, I'm getting more annoyed about James the longer I talk about him. When he's like, you always ruin things, make peace. You always poke holes in plans. I'm like, she's keeping you alive, you idiot. <laughs> like, you would be dead without her. Uh, yeah. So I obviously had some issues with James as well. Um, I was like, I couldn't remember if she was actually able to rescue him or not like i thought she wouldn't be able to for a while but then as we spent more time on it i was like okay maybe there is a chance and i wanted her to succeed but it was more because what happened to him would be horrible to happen to anybody and like i loved make peace and i wanted her to be happy rather than like for james's own sake um so i, I get what you mean about like not being convinced that um i don't know almost like not being convinced that like all this effort for him was <laughs> uh appreciated or yeah, like was... that's exactly what i mean yeah yeah uh james was and it's interesting to you that like the book by the end points out that this is like kind of a fatal flaw of his is that he's like easily swayed by like the chance at being better than he's been treated which is understandable but the way he acts on it is like <laughs> very frustrating um anyone said i understand where james came from but she had the advantage of her mother's harsh teachings he was just a young boy tantalized by this ancient influential family she sees the danger yeah that's a good point her mother did kind of train her for this um i mean he did grow up though with the felmonts yeah, like and he was ready to escape the minute he met her he was already ready to escape at that point so yeah yeah, and isn't is he, like, a couple years older than her? Or did I make that up? I'm maybe, not, I'm, maybe I made I that up. I don't know. It could, he could be. I was like, is he supposed to be even more mature than he is? <laughs> like, um, Yeah, so. Yeah. And like, even at the end, right at the end, he still, like, feels some ownership of the castle and the... Yeah. Um, I didn't think it's, you know, it's drawn attention to and... So even after everything they've done to him, he's still, you know, drawn by power and status. And yeah. Like, and like on. he kind of, <laughs> he kind of buys into uh, the like family legacy a little bit, mm -hmm. um, which I actually, I think that's a really interesting way to go. I kind of like that we get that at the end, but they're like his other choices are just what like it did crack me up though near the end there's like um when they're trapped in the chapel with is it sir thomas maybe and like the ghosts are going to be looking for a new home and so they're trying to get out and james is like i'm not gonna leave you behind she's like well last time you got left behind <laughs> like it didn't go well he's like you're gonna win every argument with last time you got possessed aren't you <laughs> like <laughs> Uh, uh like i think makepeace is like fully entitled to boss him around like <laughs> yeah oh james he i also i do think it's interesting that like he like the power that he did have throughout the book was like he was able to like charm people um but it didn't help him much in the end kind of he needed makepeace to be like the ruthless one um or the practical one. 
I just, oh my god, it just made me so mad when he was like, you always ruin things. <laughs> like, you mean she stops you from being murdered? Yeah, she's a ruiner. <laughs> like, and it, would, it would be one thing if she was poking holes in his plans and that was it. But she had an alternative. She she had a better plan. Like, shut up, James, and let her do what she's better at than you. Um, Awen also thinks he might have been older. I mean, it wasn't by that much, but like, yeah, I, I just think it's interesting that he was ready to escape, but he also had longer of being kind of like indoctrinated into mm. the Felmont, like legacy, but also he has seen more of the horrible stuff than she has, you know, like, or, or he would, he's been aware of it longer than make peace. So I still feel like he, I don't know, like the, he, he didn't witness what happened to Sir Thomas though, and make peace did. And I, I guess that was kind of a significant, like, that's what made her realize, I think, or kind of reinvigorated the idea that like, we can't just wait around. Like we have to get out as soon as we possibly can. So I don't know. I guess like the bottom line is like, there were maybe some extenuating circumstances, but James was still very frustrating. I'm glad that like he, they made it out. Okay. Though that she was able to rescue him. Um, it took a long time though. I was like the end of the book <laughs> when she finally did it. So, okay. Uh, Next, I want to talk about Simmond. I feel like he, like the Felmots are in general, like the antagonists, but I feel like Simmond is like the only one that I have like specific thoughts about or like that I think had, I don't know, I think his, his role in the book was really interesting. So I want to know what you thought of him. And if, I also want to know not just what you thought of him, but like, did you peg from the beginning that he was going to be one of the main villains? I don't know if I knew he was going to be the main villain but he was definitely suspicious from early on particularly since Makepeace didn't like him and James was so like you know joined at the hip sort of yeah you, know, you, you, you just know that nothing good is gonna come <laughs> James has terrible judgment so we knew this was bad <laughs> um he's like the opposite of bear it's like don't trust James's instincts ever um yeah, I, like, sorry, I feel like whenever it's one that I've reread, I keep talking about the first time I read this book, so I'm gonna keep doing that, um, but I do remember that Simmond was one that I wasn't sure about from the beginning, like, obviously, as the book goes on, he does some, like, very horrible things, and we're like, all right, it's pretty clear, he's, like, not a good guy, but the one of the big things he does close to the beginning is he turns on the Felmots. And so that would made me think like, oh, maybe he is going to be an ally for make peace at some point. Um, I think also like we've talked about how Frances Harding, like she's a big fan of the like plot twist betrayal, you know? So I think sometimes I'm like fooled by the characters where I'm like, well, you seem really shady. So maybe the plot twist is that you're not. <laughs> so I think that's what happened to me with Simmons for a while. Um, obviously not this time around. I remember he was bad, but yeah, he's just, he's such an interesting character. And I also think it's interesting that near the end, when we hear about what, like, the, the way his mind was, like, pruned and, like, how he's telling Maypeace, he's like, well, you could just stop yourself from feeling anything. It's really easy. And she's like, ah. um, I thought that was interesting because it, like, suggests that the reason he is the way he is is, like, because of his environment but I also don't feel like the book was trying to get us to like, you know, excuse him or feel sorry for him. So I, I don't know. Do you have do you have thoughts on that? On like Yeah. No, I agree. I I guess a bit like James, that what there might have been extenuating circumstances and it might have been all his fault, but he still I mean you know, if if he'd really been pruned and like groomed that much then he would have been in theory loyal to the film so clearly some of that is coming from oh, himself that's a really good point yeah i hadn't thought of that um well and we'll we'll talk about some of these characters later on but we do see that it is possible to um to like grow up and be groomed by the family and then to like break away and to you know do the right thing um yeah yeah, so I think, like, 
like you were saying, by comparing him to James, I think that there were circumstances that made it harder for him. But I also feel like at the end of the day, like he's choosing, like the eating ghosts thing is something that like the Felmont family did not do, you know? So like that was, I think that was his idea, um, which suggests that like he's, he was, I feel like he was like set up to go a certain way, but he's the one who chose to actually like follow through. Um, and then, oh, going back to James for a second, I felt Francis Harding was playing on like a teenage need to be accepted where James is concerned. Yeah, that's, that's true. It also, it's like her main characters are always like so strong and so smart that I feel like in comparison, it's like, why can't you just be like make peace? Like, <laughs> come on, James, get it together. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts on Simmond? Yeah, I, I guess in in his defense, that like the the film way is that you only get to live if you're exceptional. So mm -hmm. he's clearly grown up knowing that he has to be, you know, more than just himself. And especially after he sees his father basically be subsumed, you know, he he feels like he needs to make something of himself but equally then he when he runs away he's never going to get the rest of the ghosts so i'm not sure what he was trying to achieve yeah um i i've got the feeling that what he was going for was like getting rid of the rest of the family and also protecting himself from being you know, erased by the ghosts by like getting rid of his family. Um, and also he was very like greedy and selfish and he wanted to, I guess, own all of the land and the money. Um, yeah, I think also like, it's so interesting the way, like his relationship with his father sounds very messy um, because I feel like one of the only times we see Simon to have some kind of emotional reaction is when he witnesses his father being murdered essentially. Um, and I think it's interesting that it is after that point that he turns against the family. Like I, he might've been planning this for a while, but I feel like that was kind of a catalyst, which those are things that would suggest that, like that's not, that's normally something that a character would do if they are open to being a good guy. You know what I mean? Um, even though he obviously does horrible, like he didn't care about that whole regiment, which I don't think I picked up on that the first time I read this, that like, yeah, he turned against his family, but the way he did it was like just sacrificing like his entire like regiment. Um, where was I going with this? <laughs> like, I just, I went off on a tangent. Now I can't remember my major point. Um, oh, it was about his relationship with his father. And then like when we see him and make peace talking near the end, like she feels pity for him but she's still like horrified by what he has chosen to do and I, I guess that's kind of how I end up feeling about him is like I do feel sympathy for him I kind of wonder what he would have been like if he hadn't had this upbringing but also like at a certain point you are responsible for your actions so I don't know there wasn't really a conclusion there I'm just musing about Simmond <laughs> yeah complicated one yeah i actually he made me think about you know comparing this again to um fly by night is that the first one uh it reminded me just a tiny bit of lady tamarind because they give me the same feeling of like you're evil but you're very interesting <laughs> like <laughs> and i don't like your scenes are interesting to me and also there's like a tiny part of your motivation that I think is actually sympathetic, but also you're horrible <laughs> you, and you don't care who you hurt to get what you want. So actually that should have just been a, a discussion question. I didn't officially put that on, but like we've kind of been comparing this book to fly by night throughout the discussion. Um, okay. So uh, should we move on to make pieces passengers <laughs> um like all of the ghosts that she's like sharing her head with um 
And do you want to start with anyone in particular? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, do, I thought they were all really interesting, especially in how different they all were and in like how she collects them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in, I guess, how her confidence grows as she interacts with them as well. Yeah. Did you have a favourite? <laughs> Possibly Morgan, but I also liked Live Well. It was Live Well, right? I liked Live Well too. <laughs> no, yes, well. that was his name. <laughs> yeah, I thought that like the running joke about Make Peace's name and like, <laughs> I mean, the Puritan names in general was kind of funny. Um, yeah, I, I also really liked Live Well, and I did not remember Lady Morgan's character arc at all so when we find out who she is I'm like oh no I was like, get her out of there um but she ended up I guess I guess she was kind of the plot twist of somebody being an ally ally who you didn't expect um yeah I I mean I love when like you were saying the different ways that she like meets them and like they're very different personalities um and I just like was so it, it was it was so I guess sweet that um, the reason she met Livewell uh, is that he was so upset about possibly causing somebody's death mm -hmm. that he like the reason he hung around was not because he wasn't ready it was like because he didn't want to be a murderer, um, which I thought was very I don't know endearing is a weird word to use but like it it endeared me to him <laughs> early on and then as soon as he gets in there he's like he starts freaking out like, she's like could you stop praying for just like two minutes <laughs> like, oh, but he comes around uh yeah um i didn't really have that many thoughts on benjamin quick uh obviously i hated that he betrayed her but he came around too eventually <laughs> Yeah, I thought um, the interactions with, between Quick and Livewell were really interesting because they're both on different sides of the war and they both feel very strongly about it and make peace does not at all. Yeah, yeah when she says she's like, uh, I don't care to smash peace for who wins the war and they both like lose it. They're like, how could you say that? But then she's like, well, I want to bring down the Felmots and everyone's like, all right, we can agree on this. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, any other thoughts on the various characters that are in Make Peace's body? <laughs> um, it's very crowded in there. I'm like, how many more people can she collect? <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought like the general ghost law was interesting as well in the, like the difference between the way Make Peace collects them versus the Felmot ghosts and how they like take over your entire body and maybe it's because make peace has fewer or maybe it's because she has a stronger character or because the ghosts are not found lots i don't know could, or combination of all three yeah and that she's kind of trained herself to be like her mental defenses you know from her mother um trial by fire but <laughs> her mother did was trying to help her um yeah it is it is very different the way she goes about it and also the way that like, the reason that she does it, like, obviously the Felmat is about, like, maintaining power and, you know, their, um, like, extending their privilege by living unnaturally long lives. Um, and then for Make Peace, it's about giving people second chances, which I think is very in character for her. Um, I mean, even the way the book ends is, like, she introduces herself by saying, like, we believe in second chances for people who don't usually get them. Um, which I think is, is really nice. And also like we see at the end that like Livewell is kind of, he's like almost ready to move on. Mm -hmm. So she's kind of like a, a rest stop almost like, but in like the nicest way. Um, yeah. I also think it's, it's kind of funny or interesting that she's like, understandably like the first time she has to take on a ghost she's like freaking out about it and she's like this is a horrible mistake but i have no better option and by the end she's like climb aboard <laughs> like it's room for everybody um just because she's done it so much by this point yeah 
Um, do we want to talk about her mother really quick? Because I think she's very interesting that she's barely in the book, but she has like a very strong effect on make peace. Um, so thoughts about her. Yeah, I really, I really wanted more of the mother. The whole book I was waiting for, like, this mm -hmm. is, we're going to get the mother. This is more of the mother's reasoning. And um, yeah. because all we really learn about her is that Sir Thomas helped her escape and that's it. And then she was very strict with Makepeace and, you know, had a difficult relationship. But I really liked Makepeace's realisation at the end that, like, she did love me and she was yeah. trying to protect me and yeah um like i i like that make peace was able to find peace with her mother's memory near the end weirdly through lady morgan kind of <laughs> um but it's it's sad that like it she didn't it's not like she got to meet her mother's ghost to do that you know it was kind of like all in her memory which i thought was interesting um yeah i also i felt very similarly like her mother was such a strong and interesting character that i wish we had seen more of her um rather than just like memories of her um but i i also i guess that's kind of like the experience that make peace has is that she doesn't know as much about her mother you know and it's like well we don't either <laughs> so maybe it was intentional um anyone says bear is the best yeah i was thinking of like bear i feel like is is the top one uh the doctor next then morgan then live well but only because of the ending it's interesting i think live well is probably one of my favorite like the doctor is my least favorite but i think probably that's because he like betrayed make peace immediately um so he lost points for me there uh, but i actually did enjoy all of them like i don't know who i would pick between live well and lady morgan because they're both so interesting in different ways um i think bear is my favorite but yeah, they were, and like once again, we have a Frances Harding protagonist who like turns people good by the sheer force of her determination. I love that. <laughs> it's like very never fell. And um, oh, what's her friend's name? I just forgot it. Ernest? No, Ernest. No, um, not erstwhile. The the girl. What's her name? The one who's like a Childerson. Zuel. I think it's Zuel. Like it reminded me like of Neverfell and Zuel, where like Zuel's like, I'm a bad person, you can't fix me. And Makepeace is like, what a or not make peace, whoa. <laughs> um Neverfell is like, what if I just love you even harder? Like I mean, Makepeace wasn't, I think, that emotional about it, but it was kind of like she was very practical about it. She's like, she's either gonna betray me or she's not. And that right now I need her help. What's the worst that can happen? I'm already in prison. Like, <laughs> but it worked, and I love that. Um, I loved how much, oh, this is about her mother. I loved how much she tried to protect Makepeace and how much of the book is like, did she infiltrate her or not? And she didn't, and she told Makepeace to get away so she wouldn't. Yeah, that realization that she was like protecting her. And I thought I remembered, like, I don't know that I remembered it was because of the ghost thing, but I assumed she was trying to get her away from the riot, you know, that, um, but like, obviously having your mother scream that as her last words would do a number on you like I don't blame make peace for being confused um okay and the last couple characters um I, I don't know if we wanted to talk about Helen or Peg briefly uh the like <laughs> the friendly spy mistresses um and then the only other one is that if we had any felmots that we specifically wanted to talk about I, for me they're kind of just like this group of mm -hmm bad people um except for lady morgan eventually and then obviously simmond was messier than the, re the rest of them but yeah any any thoughts on helen or peg yeah i liked helen she like like she she tried to mother make mm -hmm. peace um in a way that she couldn't like there was a limit to what she could do um yeah. But she, you know, when she like when she she left make these half her purse, like that's that's Definitely. quite a a lot to do, um, especially yeah. considering how short of money everyone was. Um yeah. and when she thought that like Makepeace had fever and was going to die, she just, you know, left it there. So Yeah. I like that for the most part, the betrayals that happen are not with 
like the common folk, <laughs> you know, like, um, like I feel like we kind of see that they, they stick together. Like even the Axworths, I think, like the people mm -hmm. on the farm, like when you meet them, it's like, oh my God, they're murderers. Make peace, get out of here. <laughs> but they're not really, I mean, kind of, um, like they're kind of, they're having to make horrible choices like everybody is and they're trying to survive and um, May Peace does something good for them and then they help protect her. And then like you said with Helen, she does what she can for Make Peace. Um, like I feel like most of the, I guess random pe people they meet along the way are for the most part good. Like they're, they're trying to take care of themselves but they also, um, I, I think they're more willing to help others than they maybe think they are. Like, it's not, it's not like every person for themselves, you know, mm -hmm. um, like it is with the Felmots really. So, uh, and then speaking of Felmots, did we have anybody we wanted to talk about for them? I don't know if any of them particularly stood out apart from Simon. Like you said, I guess Lady mm -hmm. April was maybe the one we saw most of, but I don't know if she had a, personality beyond the general film art agenda <laughs> right right yeah they were kind of just like a collective uh which is the point i mean that's what they were there for but yeah um let's see okay yeah that was about her mother um all right so let's get into the themes always a good time <laughs> with these books uh so i feel like one of the big ideas that this book talks a lot about is the idea of loyalty um and so i wanted to hear your thoughts on that like like there's various kinds i think that are um like a lot of the book is based on like the idea of being loyal to people or causes or something so i wanted to know any thoughts you had on that yeah i thought the like like you said the different types or like sizes of loyalty like whether it's like to a side in the war or to uh, like to the like at the film of the larger entity or to an indiv individual person that we make peace loyal to James and how like it can be how any of those can be a driving force for a person um whether it deserve it or not um yeah, yeah. um yeah yeah, I think that's very well said. Um, yeah, I like there's so many different kinds of loyalty. Like we have like political, obviously, you know, between the parliamentarians and the royalists. Um, but we, familial loyalty is also a big one. Like the Felmots are clearly very big on that. But for Make Peace, it's just about James for the most part. Um, we even have like religious loyalty. I feel like the way that is talked about in this book is very interesting as well. Um, like May Peace obviously is Puritan. She's like raised with a very like a very insular community and um very like us versus them kind of thinking and as well as some other characters. And the way that is challenged, I think, is very interesting. Um I also I I think it's interesting that like Make Peace on the surface, it looks like she doesn't have any loyalty to a larger cause. Like you were saying, it's pretty much just James. But I also feel like she's kind of one of the most loyal characters in that she's loyal to, like, people, you know, like, everybody, really. Mm -hmm. She's like, I don't care who wins this war. Like, I just don't want the rest of us to get destroyed. <laughs> like, which is, like, arguably the, she's one of the most loyal characters in the book because everything she does is in service of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then we kind of talked about this earlier, but like with James, he feels, I think, more of the Felmont loyalty than Make Peace does. Mm -hmm. um, like she recognizes the the temptation of being part of this like great legacy and everything, but she's not really interested in it for a second. And James is. Um, and Simmond is as well, even though he obviously betrays them. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I think we kind of see that with Grizz Hayes. I don't know how to say that. I'm just guessing. Um, being destroyed at the end is like, even Make Peace, there's like that like second of, like she hates this 
place, but it stood for so long, you know, who are we to destroy it, which I thought was interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess James is having now having another thought about James is that he grows up like by Simmons' side, and I guess I'm not sure if he's treated differently to Makepeace. Makepeace grows up in the kitchen as a servant. She has right. no loyalty to the Felmots, whereas James, I yeah, might be was... wrong, but I get the impression that he's whether it's because he's a boy or because we 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 don't know who James's mother was. I don't think right. Um, but he, like, even so, anyone was saying about how um, Makepeace had the warnings from her mother, but even when they're there, their experiences are very different. And maybe that's partly also why James is so um, more loyal to the Felmots than Makepeace is. Yeah, he's kind of given a higher position, um, which, like, Makepeace actually had a lot of advantages in terms of planning her escape, you know, by being a lowly kitchen girl, but. Yeah, and we're even told that as James got older, especially, and he was kind of Simmons' right-hand man, sort of, um, that he was viewed as, like, I mean, they were all, like, vessels, but he was, like, the best-treated one. Um, so I think, yeah, that that is probably why he was more tempted, is because he was treated better. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then also on themes, we talked a little bit about this, but I don't know if you had any other thoughts on the way that religion is handled in this book. And um, I mean, like, there's like a lot of religious conflict, but for the most part, I feel like it's in the background. Um, like, obviously, we have people from some of whom feel very strongly, like uh, live well, <laughs> we know. Um, but then we also see, I think, with some of the things that happen that it's not so clear cut. Like when he's thinking about um, he and the other soldiers destroying that chapel and like the way that he remembers that it clearly bothers him. Um, so I don't know if you had any thoughts about like the religious themes or portrayals. Yeah, I thought it was definitely more nuanced or not. Yeah. I don't know if it was more nuanced or if it was just less there at all generally because Makepeace is so uninterested in it like she's grown up as a Tripton but she doesn't really have strong feelings about it anymore um and I like even though obviously we have lived well I feel like Makepeace is so uninterested in it that it's it's just in the background that it's kind of not uh it's not as much of a discussion as it is in like so in the light tree like faith is right. really invested in the answer of whether God exists or not. Whereas here, like, it's not as urgent, I guess. Yeah. Um, I also feel like it was more nuanced in this book as compared to some of her others. Um, but I agree that it wasn't like a driving force. Like, I think most of the conflict was about like the political stuff happening, which obviously there was a religious element to that. Um, like, especially the, <laughs> like we hear about like what the papists are doing and everything. So that was like, something people talked about um but it, it's almost it almost feels like Makepeace is like culturally puritan you know like because she she was raised like that but it wasn't we don't really hear like how um apart from at the very beginning we don't hear a lot about what she thinks about these different like beliefs or like practices um yeah, so I, I agree. I think it is more in the background. But when it is there, I do feel like it was more even-handed mm. than in some of the other books. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think if there was any yeah. other. Although I also, I like, I guess the the conflict in this one is between two different sects of a religion rather than, like, religious versus no religion, which maybe right. also is a difference. yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, so it's set in a time when puritanical beliefs were clashing with Protestant and Catholicism. I think Francis Harding is saying something about puritanism here more than anything else. Yeah, I I agree. Like, I think um, having like making the choice of your protagonist being a Puritan, I think, is very interesting. And apart from like you know some of the jokes about the names <laughs> and everything, I do feel like. 
we're not necessarily supposed to think like the Puritans are all like ridiculous or all, mm -hmm. you know, like stupid. Like I think the, I think we're supposed to feel that like live well, for example, is genuine. Um, which I, I like that, that it's not, it's not about saying one fraction is like more right, right than another. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So another thing I think is interesting about this book is that like so much of it is about death and ghosts, obviously, but I kind of don't feel like surprisingly, I don't feel like the book is a lot about grief, but I wanted to know if you like, apart from her mother, that's a big element, but I wanted to know if you had thoughts on that. Like if you felt that grief was a big part of this book. I hadn't really thought about it, but now that you've said it, I would agree, I guess. Make peace doesn't like the only death that make peace really experiences is her mother because everyone else just ends up inside her um so there's like there's no one for her to grieve um i and nobody else i mean we don't really see from anyone else like uh, the other people who die are not in make peace direct experience in yeah. a way yeah, um, I <laughs> I think it's funny. Like most of the people who die are still hanging around. <laughs> um, I kind of feel like the book is more about like the the fear of death, and then also like this idea of second chances and p getting to decide who lives or dies. Like I think that's a big component. But like yeah, like I was saying, I don't think the grieving process itself is really um, a focus here. Um, which I think is interesting. Like, it's weird to read a book that is so much about like death and for it to not be about the emotional component of that. Um, but I, I mean, I think it works though. <laughs> like, um, yeah. And definitely like we do see some stuff about like how, how being a ghost is like this kind of in-between space. Like we know that like live well is not going to hang around forever and I feel like at the end make peace and James are kind of like we were saying they're like uh resting places almost like as you kind of come to terms with it and figure it out which I think is very interesting um anyone said I think the next book will highlight this more but Frances Harding I believe must have researched religion to a great extent to discuss it as she does I say this having just read quite a historical book about religion um yeah I do think it's something that she finds very compelling to write about uh, I think depending on the book you're reading, it's interesting to try and like her, her ideas about it, I think seem different depending on the book. Um, but I feel like this is one of the ones that hand handled it in the, the most balanced way, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't a primary focus. Um, okay. And then I think this is kind of my last theme question because I <laughs> we can talk about these books all day. Um, but my last kind of theme question is I feel like the discussion of class and privilege is like a huge element of this book we did talk about that already but I feel like there's other stuff to say so what are you what are your thoughts yeah, yeah. the idea of like whose life is important whose life is worth preserving mm -hmm. um is definitely there and I because I mean the book ultimately comes down on everyone this life is you know equally worth it even whoever random people we meet right at the end in the last paragraph um yeah um and like that's really what make peace dance for like a bit about um what we were saying about make peace loyalty to everyone mm -hmm. um kind of regardless of class regardless of you know the amount of privilege and it's something that the felmots just don't understand at all um, yeah that that anyone who's not of their status would be deserving of life even better yeah. than anything else yeah um and i think it's significant and very satisfying that uh the lord felmont ghosts are brought down by the fact that they could not even comprehend that a common person would would like i don't know have <laughs> have emotions um uh, would have a brother like the fact that 
he is killed because um, this random character who we don't even know their name, but he's like, my brother died in that attack. And like, or is it, it's Simmond with Lord Felmont's ghost in him. Is that, <laughs> I don't remember who was inside, <laughs> like who at that point, but I, I always find that like uh, very satisfying when the evil people's downfall is because they just don't care to pay attention to anybody else. Um, the fact that Felmont think we can't continue without the voices of the past is restricting and chilling. That's a, yeah, that's a good point is like, they say that it's about knowledge, but it's also about like, having this like iron grip on the present and the future um yeah yeah that's a really good point yeah um i'm trying to think if there was anything else yeah i also i obviously agree that make pieces um loyalty is like regardless of any differences between people and I, I also like I like that she can still it doesn't it doesn't mean that she's going to like refrain from fighting them, but like the fact that she can still feel empathy for like even for Simmond, you know, or even for Sir Thomas. Cause she like when he dies, she's like, I feel sad about it because he was nice, even though he was part of this like horrible thing. Um I think that's another commonality with Frances Harding's main characters. <laughs> um and I love that, yeah, one of the main messages of this book which I, again, I feel like is common in her books is that like everybody matters. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to you that the Philmots, like they view themselves, I think they say this a few times as being like, you know, divinely chosen to do this, mm -hmm. but what they're really doing is trying to play God themselves, you know, like they're deciding who lives and dies. Um, yeah. Okay, and any other like themes that you wanted to talk about before we finish up? I think those were the big ones that I had as well. Um, I did wonder if you had any thoughts on the relative creepiness level of this book <laughs> compared to her others. Less. Um, I. It depends on the reader and what you find creepy, I guess, um, because mm -hmm. like the idea of having ghosts inside you is terrifying. Um, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but like the the actual tone of the writing is much less like a horror vibe than something like Cuckoo Song, for instance, is much yeah. more. Um, or even Verdigree Deep, I kept thinking yeah. about a couple of those scenes. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, so I, I guess it's just testament to her writing the way she can turn the creepiness on and off. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I feel very similarly. Like the content of this one, I think, is some of the creepiest. Um, as you said, that'll depend a lot on like individual readers. Cause like, like I said, I don't like this kind of ghost stuff. Like, uh, I wouldn't have read this if it wasn't by her, probably. Um, also rereading it is less uh, disturbing, you know, cause you know what's coming, but yeah, in terms of the actual, of like specific scenes and also the general tone, I feel like it is less uh, creepy overall. Um, yeah, and then were you gonna say anything else about any themes or like ideas you wanted to talk about or any characters or anything really? Cause I think those are the, my main questions before we get to quotes. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. Anyone says she feels Frances Harding does horror well. This coming from someone who abhors horror. I agree. I'm the same. <laughs> yeah, neither of us are a big horror. Yeah. <laughs> says either. Yeah, this kind of like atmospheric horror is like the kind I can do. Like we were saying with Cuckoo Song and For Degree Deep is like it's pleasantly creepy. Like there are a couple of like genuinely, you know, freaky parts, but it's not, uh, it's not a horror novel. <laughs> yeah, um, I think the last thing I had was the ending, which I felt very confused about when I first mm -hmm. finished it. But I think having discussed the themes has brought me around on it. Um, like the 
symbolism of it, I guess, because the people, Hannah and Tom, are not people we've met before, right? I couldn't right. remember if they were or not, and I didn't have time to go back. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think, it was, I think it was confusing to name her Hannah when we had just been talking about Helen, because for a second I'm like, wait, did Helen die? <laughs> um, but no, we have not met them. They're completely new characters. Yeah, which, like, threw me off when I read it. Um, but I, I, I like how it um, feeds into the, the, like, what you're saying about James and Makepeace as a rest stop and the idea of, like, ghost as a, like, come to terms with your life and death and then move on. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like a very the ending is very different from anything else in the book because obviously suddenly we're following like a random like a character we didn't know um but yeah i think it works i think it works with the story and it gives us a good sense of like what make peace and james are going to do now um i like it i like the way it like the emotional note it ends on i think is appropriate <laughs> um yeah. Oh, I don't know if you had any, if you wanted to talk about, like, the kind of final battle scenes. Uh, I think those were well done. Very intense. I am baffled and amazed that Make Peace could come up with so many brilliant plans in quick succession that had, like, like 3% chance of working, but they worked. Like, <laughs> Yeah, well, I feel like this is also a Francis Harding trademark. Theme. Yes. <laughs> we have a plan and then cut to, like, mid-plan. Rita has no idea. <laughs> It's like, is everyone going to be okay? What's going on? Um, yeah, the, the like, sneaking Lady Morgan into Simmons was very interesting. And I, I couldn't, like, I thought she was going to, like, try and take him over. But what she actually was doing was setting him up to be taken over by the other ghosts, right? I, like, I'm still trying to, like, organize in my head exactly what happened. Like, as I was reading it, I, like, followed it, but trying to summarize it, I'm like, mm, I don't know, it worked. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was very stressed at the sheer number of times Make Peace got captured and imprisoned, though. Like, <laughs> it was really stressful. Uh, yeah, by every different side and yes. like, permutation. <laughs> the, the one thing everyone could agree on was, like, locking make peace up <laughs> like um uh, yeah the parchment being hidden in the lighting of the door was very good uh, i just i just love how crafty and sneaky make peace is <laughs> like when she's like well i moved it to a different corner of the door because like i basically used the same trick on him that he used on everyone else which is that why would you check somewhere you already checked so yeah i thought that was yeah cool. i feel like it's interesting as well like um comparing it to the other books like we've been saying it's much more it still has a lot of plot twists but the plot is more straightforward than something like fly by night or even like a face like glass um it's much yeah even though it's twisty it's i guess it's more linear or it's less like there's less going on yeah like the the goals don't really change so much like there's betrayals and reversals and crazy schemes but like for the most part you kind of know from early on what the end goal is. Like, Makepeace wants to save James, uh, which we discussed. <laughs> um, and then also, like, the big one is bringing down the Felmots. So, yeah, I, I think that's... It's, like, normally I feel like in her books there'll be some kind of shift where you realize, like, um, like the main characters realize what they think is happening is not really happening or something. And it's like, we actually know from pretty early on what the Felmots are doing. Like we learn more about it, but like, yeah, it's um, like the twist is not what's going on. If that makes sense. Like the, the main plot. Um, yeah. And I guess in other books, it's uh, like, there's something much bigger at play here and the world needs saving. Whereas here it's like the world is in the background. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree. Uh, okay, anything before we finish off with quotes? I have I have a few for these. So. <laughs> I don't think so. That's, there's nothing else in my notes. All right, so do you want to lead us off with quotes? Okay. 
Um, okay. Trust was like mold. It accumulated over time in unattended places. Trusting her was convenient. This is Mistress Gottley. Distrusting her would have been inconvenient and tiresome. Over the years, Makepeace had become encrusted with other people's inattentive trust. Yeah. It's again, her power is in not being noticed. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, or the part where she's watching like the party and one of Simmons' friends like ruins that handkerchief. And she says, stop being a Puritan, she told herself. It is his handkerchief and his ale. He can spoil them if he wants. And yet the waist enraged her. Somebody had worked for weeks to make that lace, stitch by careful stitch. Unknown sailors had braved terrible dangers to carry the soup spices from other lands. She herself had spent some time preparing the lamb's wool ale. The young blade's little show of lordly high spirits had wasted more than money or fine goods. It had wasted other people's time, sweat, and effort without a thought. That's very indicative of make peace as a character. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's um, what you were saying as well about the nuance um, and the way that she, like the Puritanism, maybe like some of the religious, you know, it's not, some of their values are still like valid or yeah, reasonable. Um, yeah. I, I agree. This is a similar one, I feel like, to yours. Habits, places, and faces grew into you over time, like tree roots burrowing into stonework. Yeah. Um, and e even just, like, the one sentence, like, this is, it's, like, such, about such a, like, random thing, but it, such a good line like she not like wastes her good writing but you know what I mean she'll use it even on things that don't matter it was a clasp without warmth like that between buckle and strap it's like when Lord Felmont like embraces his son um I just love that description and then it goes on Napies wondered what it could possibly be like to be hugged by your father's ghost infested shell <laughs> like so it's like great line and then it's like oh now we're back to like you were saying it's like the way she can turn off and on the creepiness like <laughs> at will um, so this is helen um if all who love the king could keep in tune with each other we would have the rebels routed by now but we are all fiddlers in the dark sawing away at the same strings and poking each other in the eye yeah is an accurate description for many situations <laughs> yes yeah if we could just get along we could like everybody would be happy people. um this is another one that like starts off really funny and then it gets or i guess it kind of goes from like creepy to funny to creepy again <laughs> um so it's when the lord felmont ghosts have already taken over sir thomas Lord Falmont sat waiting for her, and never had his stillness looked less serene. As she walked in, he turned his head to watch her approach. Not for the first time, Makepeace wondered which of the ghosts within him had moved his head, and how they decided such things. Did they vote? Had they all taken on different tasks? Or had they worked together for so many lifetimes that they were used to acting as one? Lord Felmont was not a man. He was an ancient committee, a parliament of deathly rooks in a dying tree. It's like funny, <laughs> then messed up at the same time. What she does best. I also, I, I just took a picture of like one of the title pages because I love any reference to Judith. <laughs> like, <laughs> Judith's thing, Holofernes. So of course I love that that was one of her aliases. Um, yeah, I don't have very many. I think I have just a couple more. Um, for three years, she had been breathing in other people's certainties, and she now realized that her opinions had quietly shifted towards everyone else's without her noticing. So I, I like, I thought that was interesting. Like even make peace is like, you know, talking about loyalty. She's not immune to being softened you know without noticing it i thought that was interesting mm -hmm. um this is another one i thought was really funny when like her and helen and peg sneak the soap <laughs> to the king um 
May P says, they gave you special pass as a laundress? Of course, he is the king. Helen gave a lopsided smile. God's appointed. They cannot help but revere him, even as they fight him. Rebelling against him is only treason. Leaving him to wallow in common filth would be sacrilege. They want his majesty defeated and brought to heel, Peg explained, but they do not want him smelly. So this was the world in all its tomfoolery. Armies might clash, multitudes might die, but both sides agreed that the king must be able to wash his socks. <laughs> <sighs> and then actually like the last like the next paragraph like ends the chapter uh it says the world was turning cartwheels make peace realized mm -hmm. and nobody was sure which way was up anymore rules were breaking but nobody was certain which ones if you had enough confidence you could walk in and act as if you knew what the new rules were and other people would believe you i feel like it's what make peace that's her whole like way of operating by the end um okay i had i have a couple more i thought i was done sorry do you have any more <laughs> i have one more um which is it's when she's being taken away um, and she's shouting for help um they would not come to her aid she knew that she was alone but the other servants might hear her and it would mean something to be remembered she wanted them to know that she had not gone willingly or quietly if they remembered that she would still be something if only a scar on their memories a pang of guilt that they tried to ignore yeah I liked that one too. That's also very much in line with the idea of like people mattering, you know, and like being remembered and how the Felmots only think of uh, of like one kind of being remembered basically. Um, oh, one of the short ones I marked is Make Peace felt an unexpected thrill at the reaction. It was a strange and heady thing, this borrowed power. It was giddying to cause fear instead of feeling it. So, but I, I guess the difference between her and James is that she gets over that pretty quickly. Um, and then also about uh, when when Maypiece wants to warn Helen that they're going to catch a spy. I know Helen would never have risked her mission for me, but in a pinch, I think she would have risked her neck. Which I love that. I think it's true. It's like you were saying, mm -hmm. it's like she... She did give up a lot, you know, to try and help make peace as much as she could. Like, she didn't turn back, but she kind of did everything else that she could. Um, and this one about her mother. But she had loved make peace. She had defied the Felmots for make peace, fled house and hearth for make peace, worked her fingers to the bone for make peace. She had loved her with the cruel purity of the mother bird who forces the fledgling out of the nest to test its half-formed wings. She had done what she thought was best for her daughter. She had been right, she had been wrong, and she would never have apologized anyway. You loved me, said Makepeace, hardly able to voice the words. <sighs> she got there in the end. <laughs> um, the cruel purity of the mother bird. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what this was like. She wasn't a super warm person, but. Okay, I think, I think those are all my quotes. Um, I also, I didn't mark any of these, but there were a few conversations between Livewell and the doctor that were really funny. Um, yeah, I, th I thought it was interesting how um, the font was different. I don't know if it's the same in yours, mm -hmm. whether it like is. I never. I wonder who made that decision. Yeah, I think it helped. I appreciated having that marker. Um, yeah. Let me see. I'm gonna try to find one of my favorite live well moments. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you wanna talk about or share? As I just, I don't know. I should have grabbed the other book, but I didn't. Well, I should have actually taken a picture of this part. <laughs> instead of let's see okay wait Eowyn was that your one quote yeah do you have any others still here um oh well I thought <laughs> this is not one of his like funny moments but when Makepeace is it says, there was a mountain of a wish in her heart. It was dark and looming, daunting and unscalable, but she looked directly at it at last. 
And she said aloud, I want to be the Felmot's undoing. Now that sounds like a cause worth the whistle. For the first time, Livewell sounded like he might be smiling. Um, I can't find any of his funny stuff, but you know what I was talking about. There's <laughs> like him and the doctor arguing was, was a good time. And then, oh, I like too when Maypeace was saying, um, she said, stop shouting in my head, erupted Maypeace aloud. Several nearby birds took off in fright. No, I do not care. Why should I? Nobody has shown me why I must die for the king or why I should love parliament better than my own hide. I wish to live and I have more than a dram of sympathy for everybody else who just wants to live. There was a long pause. I cannot blame you for that, I suppose, Livewell said at last. I tried to save my own skin too. He gave a small, uncomfortable little laugh. Forgive me, I have no right to ask you to risk your life just because I failed to live mine well. You're a young maid. I should be trying to keep you from harm. So I also, I think it's interesting that near the end, the doctor starts wondering if like, they're kind of just impressions left behind or if they are actually like the souls or spirits of people who are, you know, trapped for a while. I feel like given the fact that they can change and grow, I feel like it is, like, to me, they mm -hmm. seem more like actual, like, souls or, um, like, people's spirits. But I thought that was interesting to mention that right at the end. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I, If they were just impressions, you'd expect them to be a bit more one-dimensional. Yeah. And, it, I mean, they can even, like, switch allegiances, you know? Like, that's, mm. like, to me, they're, it, the way they're written seems more like they are an actual um, representation of a person or um, the essence of a person rather than just like a collection of personality traits. Um, okay, so if we don't have anything else we wanna cover, I did wanna mention, which I meant to do this at the beginning as well and I forgot, um, but I don't know if you guys have been following the wild roller coaster that is When Is Unraveler coming out? Um, but apparently the US publisher has pushed it back again to January. But Hannah and I have decided that we're still going to keep our schedule. Um, Cause I was planning to get the UK copy anyway. And I think from what I've heard, most of you guys who have been reading along with us, I think you will have access to the UK copy. Um, if that is gonna be a problem, let us know and we can uh, talk about alternatives, but like maybe we could do like a second live show after it comes out in the US or something. Um, or I guess we would have the other one, but yeah. So basically let us know if that's going to be a problem, but the plan right now is to continue with our schedule um, since the UK date hasn't shifted again. Um, it's still going to be September, I think. So uh, I don't know what keeps happening, but yeah, it's not coming out until January. Um, and then I also wanted to mention that we're going to be doing a kind of like wrap up discussion. Um, so after we discuss Unraveler as part of that same live show at the end, we're gonna do kind of a reflection, talk about um, some of the highlights for us. So uh, if you wanna be part of that, then be sure to tune in, bring your thoughts and opinions <laughs> to share in the comments about like favorite things, least favorite things. Um, yeah, so we just wanted to have kind of like a wrap up to reflect, you know, think back on on this live show or series of live shows. And yeah, is there anything else? Um, our next, do you want to talk about our next book, Hannah, that we're going to be reading? Yes, I didn't pick I'm, my copy up, but I'm, it I'm, is going to be Deep Light, um, which is, yeah, the second to last book. I don't have any either. So. <laughs> it's okay. Um, okay, that's high praise from Owen. Um, She's saying Deep Light is her favorite of all time. This is, neither of us have read this one, so yeah. we will keep that in mind. That's exciting. Her book all time read in 2020. So nervous on reread. Oh my gosh, Nux the Hobbit off my top spot. In my mind, it's cataclysmic. I am so excited. Uh, yeah, like Hannah said, neither of us have read this one, so. Yeah, I actually, I don't even know what the premise is for this one. I haven't read the back or anything, so. Um, yeah, we'll find out. We haven't um, discussed when the live show festival will be, but it'll probably be mid-September, I'm guessing. Right. Yes. Yeah, especially because we want to give people time to acquire the last book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so probably mid-September. Uh, keep an eye on both of our social media. Um, I guess, <laughs> theoretically, I should have put my Twitter in the description because that's where 
like we announce things is on Twitter. So I'll have to do that <laughs> afterwards. Um, yeah. Okay. Anything else we want to talk about? Anything else we need to say about uh, like scheduling or anything? I think those were the main things. I think so. Okay. Well, thank you guys for joining us again. Um, thank you. If you're watching this back after the fact, we really appreciate that too. Uh, can't believe we only have two books left. <laughs> what are we going to do? I don't know. Um, it's funny too, because like the actual read along because of scheduling things is taking longer than that, but it still feels like we barely started. <laughs> We're just getting into it. Um, okay. So thank you guys for watching and reading and we will see you next time. Bye. End broadcast.